Q is uh, the, the, the guy who actually did the experiment, most of them, and Nicola Combe, um, the molecular dynamic simulation. And uh, I also have some collaboration with some people around, essentially for the, for the material that we're using. And I'm also like to, I'll also like to, to say a special thank to Jan Han and, uh, and Dave Swalowitz because I stole probably 20 or 25 of the slides. Okay, so this is a little um, thing that you have to work with. Uh, there are a few quiz during the talk and you have to answer by showing the little piece of paper. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, so you have, you have four, there is one question and four possible answer. And if you want to give the, the answer A, so you just pull A so you can uh, read it up, uh, upright. D, same thing, etc. So we're going to try. So, so give me, so show me your, so you have to show me the, the color uh, code. You ready? Okay, well, so I don't see everyone. Who said, who said I've never been known? So the question is, who said I've never been known for my work with boundaries? Ready? Go. Okay, so, so this is what you said. So oh, that's slow. So here. Uh, it's stuck again. So, okay, so you don't see the answer, but I see it. So you have uh, eight uh, answer A. So maybe I'm not going to, to show you the, the <laughs> website. But I, I see the results here, and I see your faces. So. Um, so I've got, I've got eight answer for A, 12 answer for B, big star. One for C and, uh, and five for uh, Lady Gaga. And the answers were this one. It was tricky, actually, because <laughs> th that was said by Carrie Fisher. Uh, Maureen said something completely. It's in French, obviously. And, uh, and Lady Gaga also is, is, had also worked on, on grain boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you got the idea. There are a few others, uh, maybe more scientific. Well, th this is quite scientific. Um, the outline will be this way, so th the introduction will be, uh, so I'm going to show you many moving grain boundaries during the talk. Um, some of them are driven by grain energy mi minimization or grain boundary uh, energy minimization. This is what people call recrystallization usually. But I will, I will show you and I will insist, and most of the talk will be about the, the fact that sometimes the grain boundary move because they're stressed, so under stress, and they will relax the applied stress by moving. And this, is will, this will be uh, the part B, uh, and there will be five um, topics in, in, this, in this section. It's going to be mainly experimental. I will show you some TM and some in-situ TM. So this is a real organic dislocation or disconnection that you will see, and some simulation with a uh, fake um, defect. And at the end, I will try to convince you, <coughs> as I'm convinced, that uh, Maybe the way we looked at grain boundaries so far is probably not the, the, the right way of, of doing it. OK, so this is um, real recrystallization. This is a high entropy alloy. You, you know this stuff already. You have plenty of dislocation here. We're heating it, uh, heating this thing to 1,000 degrees. And you see one, one grain boundary here, which is eating up all the defects. And in the back here, it seemed that there is no more defect at that time. Uh, the video uh, recorder stopped at, <laughs> at that point, so I don't have the, the rest of the sequence. But we could check that after this uh, grain boundary motion. I'll show you again, okay. <laughs> yeah, what, what is interesting here is that we have that many dislocation density at, at high temperature. It's also surprising. If we go high, uh, quick enough in, in temperature ramping, we, we get this amount of, of dislocation density. OK, so same thing. This is so we can check afterwards uh, that the, the dislocation density is much lower. So obviously here there's some source that, that worked um, after the passage of the, of the grain boundary. And if we have some 
glide plane here we can also measure the fold thickness so uh, before it was about 400 nanometer and here it's 300 nanometer so it's not super thin uh, folds but still it's the, the the kind of thickness that we have to work with in in tm so in the order of half a micron i would say <coughs> this is another example maybe with a, a speed that is uh, lower uh, same thing, um, same alloy, uh, and you will see here, here you have some, some complexion of the grain boundary, it's a bit bizarre. You will see this grain boundary will move to the right. Um, what, is, what is funny here is that it's going to trail the subgrain boundary, I will see here. So the dislocation density is much lower here, but you can see that it's still high in, in this region, not as high as before. Maybe that's why the, 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 the grain boundary is not moving that fast. But you can see it's trailing two, two subgrain boundary here, and let me show you again. It's not, it's not complete. If I if I showing this thing twice, I'm not going to make it to the end. <laughs> it's not supposed to stop. <laughs> okay, so this is a grain boundary here. <laughs> And the density here is much lower. And well, eventually, if you keep recording, you could see that this is removed also, and, and this keeps going. Anyway, so this is uh, the, the way we, we, do, we do this experiment. Um, this is in-situ TM training, so just a little slide to, to tell you how we do this. Uh, so we use very small samples. Uh, mainly electropolished in the case of metals. Um, if you if you try to fib your sample, it's not a good idea when you heat them up in the in the TEM usually. Uh, this is a custom made uh, holder that we use when we want to, want to go above uh, a thousand degrees C, which is the maximum temperature we can go with uh, with a Gatton holder. Um, and this this is what it looks like. So we can strain the sample and heat it at the same time. And we yeah we we made some experiment up to. Uh, 14,000 degrees uh, using this this uh, this technique. Okay, so another example of of, uh, of classical, I would say, recrystallization or classical grain boundary motion. Uh, this is a uh, copper copper bonding when you want to do uh, 3D uh, microelectronics. So you put two microstructure of copper in front of each other, and of course you're making here some. Uh, non-organic uh, grain boundary structure. You have uh, stuff where you have almost 90 degrees uh, junction with uh, the, the grain below. And this is out of equilibrium, obviously. And if you heat that up, uh, you will see some grain that are growing in, uh, to, to the next, uh, in, in, uh, in front of it. So it's, it's eating the, the, the layer that, has, that is in front of this grain. And you have some, some grain growth in all direction here. So here at that point, you almost reconstructed the a real microstructure where the, 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 the junction between the grain boundary are about 120 degrees instead of this configuration here, which is really bad. And this is how it goes. So you have to follow this, this point here. You see you have one little cone here that is forming by diffusion. So you have a heavy diffusion along this grain boundary here, which is reconstructing this grain here and making a, a, a junction that looks better than this flat and almost 90 degrees. Uh, reconstruction. Okay, um, to go a little bit deeper and see what's going on when a grain boundary is moving, uh, people have done some higher resolution, not that many, but some have done some very nice experiments. These are the people from, uh, from Berkeley. I uh, hope it works. <coughs> so it, this is false colors. Uh, it's always uh, <laughs> grayscale in, in the TEM. But you can see that, so it's, a, it, it's an island grain here. You can see that you have a, a, an orientation that is different from the matrix and it's in this island grain here. And it's shrinking, and it shrinks by the motion of steps. So it's not continuous, it's not uniform. And at the end, of course, the thing shrinks, be, uh, completely disappears because um, the, the line tension of the grain boundary is too high. But, but the main motion uh, vector here is uh, a step, and you can see this thing is not continuously uh, uh, shrinking, but it's happening by steps. Um, okay, same thing. Uh, we also did the same thing in, in, uh, in low resolution or uh, conventional TEM. So it's the same highland grain here with island grain inside a, a matrix, and this is also collapsing. The speed is increasing as uh, the, the grain is, is shrinking. 
And at the end, you have plenty of dislocation that are coming from somewhere. We don't exactly see where they're coming from. Some are coming from the matrix, but some are also coming from the, the collapsing of the grain. Uh, another example also, it's not, not that, uh, that old, uh, from Merkel, uh, also showing that this uh, grain boundary migration happens by, by step motion. Yeah, in this case, uh, we, also, we could also show by, by diffraction that uh, <coughs> migration is not associated with shear or rotation, which is an issue if you, if you look a bit deeper, and, and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll check the, the, the thing later. Okay, so that's time to vote. <laughs> so, so to your opinion, in situ TM is a uh, technique full of artifact. This is for X-ray people. A technique for rich microscopic, which is also an oxymoron because a microscope is, is expensive anyway. Uh, misspelled Latin citation, I didn't pull it, but there is in situ something where you can find in the Bible, in Latin. And uh, one of the few ways to observe grain boundary motion and to analyze a structure. So tell me what you think. No, no, ça c'est pas bon ça. Okay. <laughs> we, ha we have some punks here. <laughs> Okay, so no one thinks it's a useful uh, few way, one of the few ways to observe stuff. Uh, uh, you say it's a misspelled Latin citation. Okay, <laughs> you, you want to you want to have fun. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, so that was that was introduction. Um, many uh, grain boundary migration under the fact that you want to minimize uh, the stress or the local energy in your in your in your system. But a few years ago. Um, Several people found out, and we also found out, that when you, when you stress a nanocrystalline metal, like, like here, like on the left, for example, this is nickel on the left, um, aluminum on the right, if you stress that, you, you start having grain growth, even at, this is, I think it's um, low temperature, this is room temperature here for aluminum, this is gold here uh, on, on, a, on a stretchable substrate, and you can see that you have extensive grain growth, that is directly uh, driven by the stress that you're applying to your system. Um, yeah, this is uh, so. This is EBSD. This is uh, ASTAR. So it's, uh, it's the same. It's an equivalent way of doing uh, orientation uh, mapping inside the TEM. Instead of having this uh, uh, Kikuchi band, we we use um, pattern matching with a simple diffraction. So it's same thing. The the, the beam I is rastering the the sample and you get back the all the orientation of the grain. And you can see along the crack, for example, here, that you have grains that are bigger than in the, in the core of the, of the material. Same here. Here, you have a crack here, and along the crack, so where the, the, the stress or the strain was maximum, uh, you have some grain growth. <coughs> uh, some of the examples, this was done also in situ in, uh, in Berkeley. Uh, by pushing with a nano indenter inside the TEM, you could see that this grain here is disappearing, so it means that the other grains here are, are growing. Um, this is a nice paper by the, the, the people from Baltimore, uh, Hopkins. Uh, yeah. they, they showed by, by stretching something with holes where they can, they, can, um, um, they can control the stress or the strain that is applied to a given part of the sample. They showed that you have grain growth essentially driven by the stress, not by the strain. I'm, I'm starting having some weird <laughs> video problem here. Okay, and this is also an experiment that we did also on aluminum. This is a crack on the, on the right, on the left, I'm sorry. And you see some, some grain growth happening right at, the, at the, the point where the stress is maximum. Okay, so, so the main question that was in uh, early 2000, the main question was, how does that happen? Are there any mechanisms that, that are on the market to explain these things? And, and pretty much you have, you have not that many possibilities. You have, I would say, five, and that I will show you. That, that my plan, my outline of the, of the talk, I'm going to go through uh, all these five possibilities. Uh, how can you get grain growth uh, when you have uh, a stress sample? So you can have dislocation activities. You have shear coupled grain boundary migration. I will spend most of the time on this uh, second uh, topic here. You may have deformation twinning, and I'm not going to talk about that today because it's also a uh, a wall field uh, on its own, and it's very specific. You can also have sliding, so, so dislocation activity, mainly you have dislocation pumping out in the grain boundary, changing the grain boundary and making it move somehow. 
Uh, Shear coupled going down during migration, I'm going to show you what it is. Deformation twinning, I hope you have an idea what it is. Sliding, you just uh, have two grains that are sliding on top of each other, and that may lead to grain growth eventually if you meet some other grain that have the, the good orientation. And that happens if you have grain rotation because grain can go back in the right orientation or the orientation uh, corresponding to the next grain and then make a bigger grain. Okay, so dislocation activity, we, we tried to, to check that and, and you already had the, the, the answer from, the, from the, the, this paper here. It's not driven by the strain accumulated by dislocation. Uh, this is also a, a crack propagation. You have, you, see you have a relatively small grain here, A, and it's stretching, stretching as you're uh, opening uh, the crack. But the grain is also thinning at the same time. You're accumulating dislocation on both sides here, and the grain looks like it's growing. It's not happening very often, and it's not very uh, efficient. Um, what happens most of the time, like also maybe you have, you've learned at school, is that when you have a grain boundary, it just blocks dislocation. And, and what, hap what may happen to all these dislocation pumped at this uh, grain boundary, some of them may transmit here, <coughs> and some of them may actually cross-slip uh, when, when you have a twin. So this is also in situ. This is at uh, liquid nitrogen temperature, and you can see that um, this is what we do most of the time. We look at this location, and we try to uh, understand how one material, uh, looking at its defect, is behaving as a bulk. And this uh, high entropy alloys behave like, uh, like steel, pretty much. You have the same dislocation and the same systems. So, so it's not, it's not, I mean, the dislocation is not uh, a very uh, efficient way to, to move uh, grain boundaries. So the second one, so it's weak effect. Second one is shear coupled grain boundary migration. So what is this? So it's not, it's not something which is uh, intuitive. Um, if you have, so you have two grain here. So we usually explain the, the, the shear grain boundary migration by a, a bicrystal. So you have an upper grain, a lower grain with two uh, different orientation. If you, if you impose a shear, so a shear that is uh, parallel to the, the screen, like uh, to, the, to the right here and to the left here, what may happen is that the grain boundary will move up or down and create, at the same time, we create a shear, the shear which is here. If the grain boundary is also uh, well-oriented, you may have some sliding, and in that case, you have the, the grain boundary is staying at the same place. It's only the shear is only produced by the, the, the displacement of the two grains. And both cases happen. Um, this one happens, so this is, these are experiments done in, uh, in Aachen. Uh, you can see that the grain boundary is moving from this position to this position, so it's, it's coupling with, uh, with the shear, and in that case, it's only sliding. Um, this has been done by, uh, <coughs> by uh, molecular dynamics also. So you can see here the same, the same system as before. These red atoms here are the ones that are uh, used as a handle uh, to apply the, the shear. And you can see that the grain boundary that was here is moving down. And at the same time, you have a shear produced that is very consequent. I mean, the, the, the shear produced by a small migration here is, is quite high. And this is the way we measure the, the shear produced by grain boundary. It's by the coupling factor. So it's called beta. And it's uh, simply the, the amount of shear divided by the amount of migration, OK? So the same thing as here. So it's, I think the notation are not exactly the same, but uh, yeah, V parallel and V perpendicular, or V, or v normal and V uh, parallel here. And here it's V parallel over uh, V uh, perpendicular, OK? So question, what is the coupling factor? So I, I, I have to be sure that you're online with me with this <laughs> first. So it's uh, beta. It's not really explaining, but <laughs> it's what I just said. <laughs> so it's the equivalent of Burger's vector for moving uh, grain boundaries. So it's a measure of the produced shear. Is my microphone? OK. Uh, it's degree of matching between two individuals on Mitic on Tinder. Uh, and could you repeat the question? If I have many of these, I have to repeat again. So, okay, go. Are you ready? Okay, you're good. <laughs> so it's B. 
um, well, it could be A, but it doesn't explain. And you know, many people are, are using Tinder and Mythic here. <laughs> OK, not that many five people. OK, so, so just to show you that it's, uh, it's an efficient uh, thing, that even people in, in MD uh, are, are showing that it's an efficient uh, way of, of making some, uh, some shear inside a um, nanocrystal. Uh, this is an experiment done by Schaffer and Albe um, a few years ago. They, they set up a, f a fake crystal, which is really oriented, so you have sliding. So you have this interface here, you're shearing the crystal, and it's, I mean, the maximum shear is applied on this uh, grain boundary here. And what happens is that when you do this, shearing is not really efficient, but, but coupling is, is. and in, in this case, the, the, the grain boundary is perfectly oriented for shear, is going to start to couple here in one direction or the other direction and completely uh, distorting this initial uh, sliding uh, grain boundary. So it's, it's very efficient. So now if you want to understand it on a physical point of view, this, this uh, coupling uh, system, uh, you have to go back to, uh, to what is a grain boundary. Uh, and the, the first and the easiest way is to start with a subgrain boundary. A subgrain boundary is made of dislocation, a perfect wall of, of um, <coughs> a line uh, edge dislocation. And the misorientation between the two grains is only uh, dependent on the Burgers vector and the, uh, the distance between this, this uh, dislocation. So this is also gr a subgrain boundary here. You can see the individual dislocation. Some of them are leaving the crystal and some of them are staying in the, in the grain boundary. Okay, it doesn't work anymore. And this actually is a very, very old experiment in zinc at um, quite high temperature. Uh, they, they looked at, at this in an in optical microscope, and they, they bent the crystal up and down. And they looked at the, the sub-boundary here, and it was also going up and down. And this is a, an experiment that was done in the, in the 50s. <coughs> And, and that, that's something that you can uh, understand because if you have dislocation, the dislocation are coupling with uh, the stress, they're moving, and as the, the dislocation are constituting the, the subgrain boundary, you, the, the, the subgrain boundary is moving with it. The situation is a bit more uh, tricky when you have a large angle grain boundary because you don't have dislocation anymore. If you look in, inside a, a TM, you won't see this uh, individual dislocation. You don't have individual dislocation in a large angle grain boundary because all the cores are interpenetrating uh, to each other. So you don't really have uh, perfect dislocation as in a subgrain boundary. So how does it work? So Canon Machine in uh, 2006 say, okay, we, we don't, we don't, I mean, we, we're theoreticians, we don't really care about what's existing or not. Um, we know that for a given misorientation, we have the frame BB equation here that will tell us, okay, we have a given density of dislocation. So we take this density of dislocation, even if it has no physical meaning, we just consider it is this density of dislocation, and we stress the crystal and see what happens. And if you do this, so it's the same experiment as uh, this one. Here, so this is uh, the MD from, uh, from Canon Machine in 2006. Uh, they did this for many orientation for symmetric <coughs> uh, tilt grain boundaries, and they found that uh, the grain boundary will, will load elastically and eventually uh, migrate by an abrupt motion of the grain boundary, load it again and uh, migrate again abruptly, and, and you have this uh, stick slip kind of uh, motion of the grain boundary. And in the system, um, the migration, so the beta factor, is going up as the misorientation is going up, which makes sense because as the, the, the grain boundary is denser and denser in dislocation, you're moving more and more dislocation at the same time, and so you have more and more shear. That's the idea. You have two branches because the, the, the dislocation can move in, in two, di two different directions. So you have this, what they call the 100 mode and the 110 mode, but pretty much it's the same trend. You're going from the zero misorientation here, perfect crystal, and you can see that the beta factor, coupling factor here, is going high or in the other direction as uh, the misorientation is going up. <coughs> this is written here. But there are other models. Um, even if you, um, if you look in the bibliography, most of the, the people uh, are, are citing a Canon machine. In fact, so ca Canon machine is really uh, matching the Reed and Shockley model of, uh, of subgrain boundary, except that you have this uh, extended beta um, factor. If you look a little bit deeper, you look at, uh, you, you'll find this uh, paper by Ray and Smith in, in the 1980. 
And instead of considering perfect dislocation, perfect lattice dislocation as Canon machine, they consider DSC uh, dislocation. And they also consider, uh, and that's another uh, way of looking at it, some defects that are called disconnection. Disconnection is just, uh, it's something that only pertains to grain boundary. It's a dislocation plus a step. And I will spend some time uh, on this now to explain you what is a disconnection and um, the basic of, of grain boundary. So this is, all this is stolen from, um, from Dave Srolovitz. So this is not my humor. I don't <laughs> back it up. Um, this is the best way to, I mean, the only way to, to look at, at a bicrystal is to do bicrystallography. So you have black lattice, a white lattice, two misorientation here. You put them together. You have, um, uh, you, so you, you put all the, 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 the lattice together. You make, uh, you have a coincident lattice here where you have these atoms here from, the, from one lattice that is corresponding to the other. And some of them are not corresponding. Then you trace your, your grain boundary. You may, you may put your grain boundary wherever you want, but you, you, you take the, the coincident site lattice because uh, the probability to have your grain boundary is higher there. Um, and now if you, and then you remove all the atoms from the top and the bottom, and you have your, your bicrystal, okay, with the coincident site lattice here. So this is a coincident site lattice, CSL, in the, in the grain boundary. And, you, and you, you can already see that you create a new, a new lattice here. And this is a sigma 5 because you have one at of five atoms that is in, in coincidence here. But you have a new lattice here in which you can define a new uh, invariant. So this is a perfect dislocation here from this point here to this point here. But you can also create other dislocation from this to here or from that point to that point, for example. And if you do this, you're not changing the lattice. You have the same lattice. You're just changing the origin of the, of the lattice. Okay, so for a crystal, it's exactly the same. There is no difference in terms of energy, uh, structure, nothing. It's just a, a, a construction reference that is changing. So if you, that means that if in this CSL lattice, you can have smaller um, dislocation vector, the, the green one, that are not changing the lattice. So if you shear your lattice with this small dislocation green here, you're not changing your grain boundary. Okay? So that's not so this all this green dislocation here do not uh, they will change the, the perfect lattice on either side of the grain boundary, but the grain boundary itself is not going to be changed. So okay, that's that's other uh, possibilities that you can have for this uh, small uh, um, Burgers vector. So it's called, so this, this dislocation are called DSC because it's a sub lattice. It's dislocation shift complete, I think. I'm not sure, I think they changed the name. So now you take your, your grain boundary, you look, it, you, you look at it end up. So you have the grain boundary here. You have the structural units uh, that we had before. And um, you have your, your, uh, um, you have your, your, CSL, uh, your CSL lattice here and you're gonna put a, a disconnection. Disconnection is here, so you're moving this this part of the lattice to the left. This will create a shift in the lattice here on the right with this, um, this shift here. And you have a Burgers vector that is here and you have a step that's generated uh, to complete the, the lattice at the grain boundary here. This is a disconnection. So this is a, the same image but with the older atoms uh, removed from, from both sides. So you have a, a, a disconnection here that is, uh, that is um, made by a, a step between these two lines here of the grain boundary and the dislocation here. <coughs> this is a way, well, this is a way that you, you do a, a disconnection inside a, a molecule dynamics, usually uh, nucleate a couple of disconnection, so your, your crystal is, is still the same. And when doing this, you're moving the disconnection to the right, to the left, and then you end up with a, a grain boundary that, that has moved up or down by one H, which is uh, the height that you define here. The trick is that contrary to dislocation, you have different way of defining a disconnection inside the, inside the system. For a given step, for a given uh, Burgers vector, for a given Burgers vector, you can have a uh, different step. So you have this small step that I show you in the, begin, uh, the beginning, but you can have also this step here, this step here, and this step here. That is important because, uh, so, so this is an example of what you, you can get in, uh, in, in this sigma 5 here. 
uh, you have a, a Burgers vector that is uh, the height of the of the um, of the step here plus the the Burgers vector associated with to this disconnection. Disconnections are existing everywhere. If you take the time to observe them uh, in uh, in high resolution, you can find some. This is also a, a bicrystal, so uh, I will I'll go back also later on, on what you can observe in this. So you have the grind boundary here. You can see that here you have a a step that is not very high, and here you have a, a step that is much higher in terms of um, in terms of distance here. Uh, you can analyze this by, uh, for example, um, geometrical phase analysis. It's a way to, to, to show you the, the displacement in your crystal. You can see that you have a small step here and a bigger step here, and, and this is the stress field that you're looking at here. So the stress fields are very confined to the, to the grain boundary. <coughs> okay, so if you have, you, uh, you, we have plenty of time in the afternoon, so you can start reading at these papers. Um, progress in material science, I think this one is 51 page, 47, 75 page, um, by uh, Robert Pond and John Hurst. This works for many fields of, uh, of material science. I mean, the disconnection can work in phase transformation, uh, displacive uh, transformation, and all this is related to the, the Frank Bilby equation. Okay, any question at that point? So yeah, this is my suggestion. Instead of going skiing, you can uh, read those, those papers. I, I can give them to you, I'll add that on my computer. Um, <coughs> yeah, mu and lambdas is a bit of historic um, thing. So you have no question, and uh, the other question is maybe a transition to the next uh, this step. Okay. There is one person that has questions, so you, maybe you can come back afterwards. Um, so, what about the energetic, energetic of this disconnection? Thank you for asking the question. <laughs> um, that's that's also uh, something on, uh, <coughs> Dave Solo has really worked on. Uh, if you have if you have a dipole of disconnection, which is probably the the, the easiest way to to calculate uh, some energy, you have the energy from the steps which is here, so the total energy of this, of this box here is the energy of the step. You have the, so the core energy of the dislocations. Uh, you have the energy of the interaction between the two um, dipole of disconnection, obviously, in this, in this case. If you have a single one, you, you can remove this term. And, and uh, this is a work done by the motion of the grain boundary, so that will compensate the, the, the work in the, in the, in the system. So, um, the step energy is uh, related to H and the, 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 gamma, the gamma energy of the grain boundary. So depending on your um, grain boundary, you may have an energy that is uh, related to H, but it's a linear uh, relation with H. I, for the Burgers vector, it's B2. So you have uh, an energy that is a function of the square uh, Burgers vector of the disconnection. And the interaction, of course, is also a, a function of B2 in that case. And this is a work done by the the, the applied stress, and it's mainly acting on the Burgers vector. There is no um, uh, work done by the motion of the, of the steps. At least, at least, I mean, the step is not um, uh, relaxing the applied uh, shear stress. So I'm not going <coughs> to go further into that, just to, to tell you that uh, it's related to H and B2. That means that if you, you want to calculate the most probable disconnection that you'll have in your system. You have to minimize its energy. So you have to minimize the height and the Burgers vector. So you need the smallest uh, Burgers vector. So that's, that's why it's good to use a DSC because the Burgers vector are small. And that's why also they, would, they should be favored uh, compared to large uh, perfect lattice dislocation like in, in Canon machine model. And you also have to, to take into account the step. So you probably, uh, for, I told you that for a given DSC dislocation, you can have many different steps, so many different disconnections. Probably the, the disconnection with the smallest step will be favored compared to the one that has uh, 10 uh, interplanar spacing um, steps. So if you do this, you, 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 you calculate all the geometry possible, and you, you calculate all the, the possible burgers, uh, the, the coupling factor. So the coupling factor is just the height of the step dividing by the, the shear 
uh, the contrary, the, the shear of the dislocation dividing by the step. And you do this for many uh, grain boundary tilt angle, and you can see that you have many of these disconnections here that have a very close to zero or zero um, energy, or that does give you a, a beta factor that is close to zero. And you have these two branches here, that are the two branches that are predicted by the Cannon machine model, which are the, the one with the perfect dislocation. So if you remember, I'll, I'll show you I'll show later. And if you increase the size of your box and the size of the disconnection, you will start having more and more uh, larger, larger and larger beta here. You're expanding the, the, the beta factor because you're increasing the step or the, the, the shear of your disconnection. And at the end, you have something like this. Uh, if you consider a larger, larger disconnection, you have the two branches of Cannon machine here for the perfect disconnection. And here you have the, um, the coupling factor that you can have for many types of disconnection. So that, that is the, the trick. This is for a given grain boundary. You may have different shear amplitude. So it's not like the dislocation. I, I'm coming from dislocation. I know that one dislocation is a burger vector. You, you know the burger vector and you know the shear. For a given grain boundary, it's different because you may have many disconnection different, so you may have different beta. And you don't know it by advance because you don't know what is the content of your, of, uh, of your grain boundary in terms of disconnection. So people have done many, many uh, molecular dynamics to, to try to compute the, the beta uh, coefficient in all these cases. So it's all uh, um, uh, symmetric tilt grain boundaries here, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. And you can see that in all this, most of this um, uh, molecular dynamic simulation, you still find a lot of these coupling factors that are uh, related to the, the perfect dislocation. So a very large coupling factor that are uh, computed. Some of them are here in the middle with a low coupling factor, but it's, it's really strange to have all these very high coupling factors, so very high energetic uh, dis disconnection. That's also something we did a few years before. We didn't know anything about disconnection at that time. We just cut some little piece of paper with two lattice here. We tried to rotate them, apply some shear, and we, had, we, had some, we came up with some equation, which is equivalent. Uh, and we, we also show, so this is the Canon machine model here, the two branches here, the green and blue, and all the possible uh, um, coupling factor that you can have, depending on the size of the, of the box that you're considering here. So the, the unit cell of your, of your, um, your crystal in the A and B, or in black and white. It's not black and white. <coughs> okay, so we did also some, um, some uh, NEB and some uh, molecular dynamics in the lab. So we, we, took, we took exactly the same system and Canon machine. And we showed um, that actually you have some disconnection uh, moving in this system. So the way, the way it works, so you have to nucleate first the first disconnection. So you, you start with a perfect grain boundary. As well, we did the same thing as every, everyone on the planet. So we start with a perfect grain boundary. Uh, we start to, to shear it, and you have the first disconnection uh, appearing here. This, this takes the most of the energy of the system, and once you nucleate the first disconnection, it propagates along the grain boundary and makes uh, the grain boundary move. So it's here, it's, it's upper position here, lower position at the end. The, the, the energy has decreased, and you have a, a, a transition, which is due to the, the complete shear of the first disconnection. OK, this is uh, the movie. It's a bit poor. Uh, but you can see that this, um, this kite uh, feature here are rotating one after the other to, to propagate the disconnection in the, in the system. We also checked uh, the hypothesis of uh, having a, um, a disconnection in the system to start with, because I think that's a way to, to, to go. In, in real crystal, you already have disconnection. And it makes a huge difference, because of course, the energy needed to, to translate this existing disconnection is much lower uh, compared to the, the, the case where you don't have a disconnection. So energy is divided almost by two. The stress also, so you have, uh, I think you're about more than two here, two gigapascal to, to uh, shear the perfect grain boundary. And here you're almost at one uh, when you have already a disconnection in the system. And this is the way it works. Uh, you have two types of, of, uh, of um, um, nucleation and propagation. You have this is a, a sessile disconnection that cannot couple, so you create a disconnection from this. It's good to so it depending if you have periodic boundary condition or no periodic boundary condition, you can recreate another uh, disconnection at the at the end and you recreate here the same grain boundary that you had at the beginning, 
with the sicile disconnection, but you move your brain boundary by one, uh, one step. Okay, so in real life, um, as I told you before, people at Aachen have done a lot of this experiment on, uh, on um, bicrystals. So they grow this bicrystal with a specific misorientation. They apply a shear, usually around 300, 400 degrees C in luminum, which is quite high. And they observe this migration here. And when you, when you compute, uh, you plot all this misorientation here for this symmetric uh, tilt grain boundary, it seems that the CAN model is fitting very well. So as, as you go away from the, the, the zero misorientation here, you increase the misorientation between the two, uh, the, the two uh, grains, the coupling factor looks like it's following this, uh, this trend. So it, it's, it's a bit strange because this means that the disconnection that you have here are dislocation with big steps or large Burgers vector. And when you compare this branch here to what we found here, it's also very completely different. So we, have, we don't have exactly the solution so far, but um, we have some, some case where it doesn't work that well. So need to, how much, oh. <laughs> so if you want, I can stop here. <laughs> uh, otherwise, yeah, I can, I can show you also some more experiments. Uh, polycrystal is interesting. <laughs> and okay, you got the idea for the uh, last one. Ready? Ho! Oh. <laughs> no, no, okay, so only one no. So I'm sorry, you can, you can leave the room if you want. <laughs> Um, okay, and the, the rest is equivalent, 10, 10, and 8 for the, for the, um, the other questions. <coughs> okay, so I'll continue. <laughs> so this is before going to polycrystal, this is uh, another bicrystal experiment. So we, we try to see what's going on in a bicrystal. So the same experiment as people in Aachen, inside the TEM. And um, instead of having, we're surprised because instead of having something which is moving uh, smoothly, oh, it's not working. Um, anyway, so we, uh, I'll save some time. What you see here, it's, it's you have some step running down the, the interface and the grain boundary is moving this way. And all these dots here are markers that we put on the, on the sample so we can follow the, the coupling factor between um, after and, and before the, the motion. So this is before, this is after. You can see all these slip lines here which, is, which are due to dislocation, so it's not very super clean experiment. All this marker here, and we can follow the, the coupling factor for this single um, grain boundary, and you can see that the, the coupling factor is not always the same. So as the grain boundary is, is shifting from this position to that position, you have different coupling factor depending on the steps that are running down this uh, interface here. So th this is surprising, so it tells us that for a given grain boundary we, we may have different coupling factor. In average, or, um, although we have something which matches the, the, the Canon machine uh, prediction also. What we found is that we also have some perpendicular, co uh, perpendicular coupling factor, which is not explained by the um, dislocation or disconnection theory so far. But the, the idea that I've, I want to promote here is that for a given grain boundary, we have different steps and different uh, beta uh, coefficient, which is the first problem uh, with the theory of, of Canon machine. It fits, it fits uh, our theory better because, of course, if you have different disconnection, you have different <coughs> coupling factor. Okay, this is uh, in a polycrystal, so we did the same thing <coughs> in a polycrystal now, a real life, or almost real life because it's a si still a, a thin specimen. So you can see that you have no dislocation around. This is done at uh, 350C aluminum. You can see that the grain boundary is moving without any uh, interference with dislocation. It's pulled by this uh, triple junction here. And if you do this, um, okay, so if you do this and you measure the, the, the coupling factor associated with the, the motion of these grain boundaries, so you have different grain boundaries, different grain here, so we can measure the coupling factor. Here we have, um, so for example, the, the we have six degrees between G1 and G2 and about uh, a beta, which is about 9%, and 14% between G1 and G0 here, and a coupling factor, which is about 10%. So it's not linear at all. Sometimes we have some very... Um, highly misoriented grain and low coupling factor, and sometimes we have some low misorientation and high coupling factor. Same, another experiment, 100, yeah, I'm sorry, oh, I have to stop in five minutes or so? Five? Eight minutes? Okay. Another example, when another um, 
same system, but um, very high misorientation here and very low coupling factor in that case. Okay. And if we are really lucky, we, we can also see that when this grain boundary are migrating, we can see also the disconnection moving. And you can also spot that all these disconnections are moving as the grain boundary is, is, um, is migrating. And they, all, they always stick to the grain boundary because this defect cannot go inside the crystal unless they have a perfect uh, Burgess vector, but it doesn't seem to be the case in, in this case. And you, you, you have also the, you, you may have noticed that the disconnection are going one way or the other, depending on the orientation of the, of the habit plane of the grain boundary. So they're going from left to right here. The, the habit plane or the, the orientation of, of the grain boundary will change, not the misorientation, the orientation of the grain boundary will change. Here we have a, a triple junction where everything sinks. At one point, the, the, the direction of the, here you can see them going back in the other direction when the, the habit plane is, has changed. So again, this is uh, what we can observe in the TM afterwards. We are not <coughs> good enough to, to do the same thing in high resolution. Some people did, I will show you them uh, before. So we analyzed many of these disconnections in, uh, in the bicrystal. So this is a regular case. So you have a, a Burgess vector and a step. So you have to, to draw some Burgess vector uh, Burgess circuit, circuit between two equivalent uh, positions, so it's a bit complicated. We have to call some people in, in Paris. Um, so uh, Sylvie Artigue will help us with, with this. So you have different cases in a single uh, bicrystal. This is another case where you have a single dislocation, but there is no step. So that's another way of looking at, at this connection. <coughs> this is a disconnection with a perfect step, so you, if you make the, the Burgess circuit here, you have no uh, no Burgess um, vector here, but you have a step, so it's a perfect step. And this is a, the, the, the most general case. Uh, you have a dislocation, so this is a Burgess vector of the dislocation. It's, it's obviously not a perfect dislocation of, of uh, aluminum. And you have a step which, which has this height here. And, and we, we created, we should have patented, patented this. So this is a new sign for a disconnection. So it's a combination of a dislocation <coughs> and a step. Maybe next time I come with a T-shirt or something. <laughs> and some people did actually the, the experiment in higher resolution. So it's a bicrystal here. The, the grain boundary is, is at this position here. Uh, it's very recent paper, I think last year. Um, and you can see that this is going to be sheared. And you can see the grain boundary will move. Maybe this work. So it's going up here, going down. And if you look at the, on, on the side here, you can also see that this uh, migration is producing a shear on the side. Especially when it's going back. So you can see the shear here. Um, really nice. The, the conclusion of these people is a bit weird. I know if they had some, some problem with the referees or, or what, but they say, okay, we see the disconnection, but maybe it's not representative of real crystals. <laughs> it's a bit bizarre. <laughs> Okay, uh, very quickly, uh, two, uh, two other mechanisms, sliding and grain rotation. So sliding, that, that also may happen. I was not really believing in this, but this is some experiment we did on, on gold. You can see that this big grain is sliding on top of this one here. If you look also in the TM, you may see some disconnection uh, running down this, uh, this grain boundary here. Um, the motion of this, I mean, the, the, the shear produced by the, all the disconnection is pretty heavy. So we have something which is about 100% uh, in that case. Um, we also check grain rotation because that was a big thing also at the beginning of the year uh, to 2000. Uh, people say, okay, it's mainly rotation in, in, uh, in nanocrystal. There was this paper in Science uh, watching the nanograin roll. Sounds cool. Um, but actually, uh, some, some people responded to that and they showed that all you can see here is just uh, an artifact of TM. So yeah. maybe you sh sh should check. X-rays again, and then they also replied. So that gives you more and more paper in science, which is a good way of, uh, of having your, uh, your impact factor of mining. Uh, we checked the grain rotation in, in this uh, small aluminum, and we actually saw that the grain rotation was very small. I mean, it's, it was not very efficient. Mostly it was grain boundary uh, shear migration coupling. So you can see, for example, between these two, this, this region here and this region, the grains are growing. And these are only the grain that have rotated, and it's only a few of them, so like I think there are 40 grains measured here and only five or six uh, rotated in, in this case. And again, when you have grain rotating, it's the same thing. You have disconnection running along the grain boundary. If you don't see them very well here, you will see them better here. Again, it's disconnection, so they 
strictly follows the grain boundary. They don't go inside the, in that, inside the real lattice. And in that case, we're able to, to check the, the Burgers vector of this disconnection that was here. And apparently, there is no step because the grain boundary is staying at the same place when the grain is, is rotating. And that, that is also what, what uh, I think Dave Srolovitz called a, a grand unified theory of grain boundary. It, it's the nice thing about this connection and looking at grain boundary with this connection is that you can explain most of the, the mechanism that I show you, sliding, uh, migration growth, shear migration coupling, by this connection. If you have a disconnection with a, a Burgos vector and a, a step height, when this disconnection will move, you'll have both a shear migration, so this will couple with this, the applied stress because you have a Burgos vector, and the grain boundary will move because you have a step height. So the, when the, the, the defect is moving, it will drag the grain boundary with it, and it also will also uh, lower the, the applied stress or the energy of the system. If you have no Burgers vector and only steps, that's what you have when you have migration and growth. So you only um, you, you have no deformation, uh, no stress relaxation, but you still have a grain boundary that, that moves. And if you, have a grain, if you have only grain boundary dislocation with no step, that is the case when you have, for example, sliding. Only the, 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 the shear is applied. You have a shear produced on the grain boundary uh, itself, but there is no migration. <coughs> and of course, if you, if you enter into the diffusion, into the, the step um, energetics, the, the fluctuation of the grain boundary, you can also take all this in effect, take diffusion into, into account, which I didn't do at all today, uh, interaction with dislocation also is a good way to unify all this, all this theory. Now, what is, it's almost, okay, I, this is the conclusion, it's part of the conclusion. <coughs> so, origin of dislocation, do you have an idea of the origin of this connection? Okay, so you have majority of B and C. You're right. <laughs> so B and C, so just a few examples. This is uh, from a triple junction. You can see some disconnection uh, emitted from this point here. You also have some dislocation that are coming into the grain boundary, may react and create some, some disconnection. This is actually a step on you. This, uh, this is too slow, so I can't show you that. But there is one dis dislocation here will enter the step. You can see the step is also running down here and, and create change the, the stress field around the, the disconnection. Another example here, one dislo this location here will interact with what this disconnection here and change the, the contrast locally. And this